Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I had to cancel today's lab. I have um, car issues that were happening today. So instead of doing the actual lab in class, we're going to have a virtual laboratory, which is going to consist of, um, at the end of which, you will need to submit assignment to me next Thursday. Now, in the submission of that assignment for me, um, I will give you 10 points for completing the assignment, and it's everything that we would have done in the lab. So the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to go over a brief PowerPoint that will, um, many of you have probably already looked at, that will discuss um, different blood cell types and the formed elements in blood. Um, we'll talk about hematocrit, we'll talk about mean cell volume, mean cell hemoglobin content, um, and what those things mean. So the first thing we'll do is that we will go over um, kind of just giving you a little bit of a lay of the land on what we're going to do. And then we also have a virtual laboratory in blood typing. So there's a virtual blood typing laboratory that we're going to complete as well. So in your blood, your blood, your whole blood, really is consisted of two major parts. You have the plasma, which is kind of a liquidy, mostly water, yellowish type part of it. And then you have your formed elements. Your formed elements would be things like your platelets, your white blood cells, and your red blood cells. Red blood cells are really easy to identify. Red blood cells are always going to be those guys that just look kind of flat and donut shaped. So this would be an example of a red blood cell. Notice that none of your red blood cells have any nuclei. They don't have a nucleus in them. And in lecture, we'll talk about exactly why that is the case. They lose their nucleus as part of their development. White blood cells, there are five different types of white blood cells. Those five different types of white blood cells can be grouped into two different categories, granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes would include the blood that we're seeing here, the eosinophil. These little granules in here, are meant to be released, and they can actually attack parasitic worms. Um, and they release other compounds and chemicals. So eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils are all considered granulocytes. They'll have little granules in them. Monocytes and lymphocytes are agranulocytes. They don't have those granules. One of the major hallmarks of an eosinophil is that it has this bilobed nucleus. So this darkened portion on the inside of the cell, that is the bilobed nucleus. Another formed element we haven't really talked about yet are platelets, and platelets have a bigger role in clotting. Next type of formed element we'll look at is another granulocyte. It's called a basophil. Basophils are really kind of nondescript. They kind of look like uh, somebody stepped on a bunch of grapes. So their nucleus does not have a nice defined bilobe nucleus like the eosinophil we just saw. Um, it definitely still has all those little granules in there. But the basophil kind of just looks like a, a bunch of stuff that just got stuffed into the inside of it. So that would be your basophil. Now, you'll notice down here, you see this term erythrocyte. We haven't used that term yet. Well, that's the actual scientific name for a red blood cell. Leukocytes are the scientific name for a white blood cell. This particular type of leukocyte is called a basophil. Looking at a lymphocyte now, so this is the first of our A granulocytes. We have lymphocytes and we have monocytes. A lymphocyte, notice that you don't see all of those little granules in there that we saw in the previous two slides for the eosinophil and the basophil. Instead, what you're seeing is a nucleus that's almost taking up the entire cell. There's very little cytoplasm that's in there. Great big, giant, nice, solid nucleus. Now, as far as the size of a lymphocyte, it's roughly a little bit bigger than a red blood cell. So if we look at the red blood cells that it's sitting next to in comparison, um, it's not that much bigger than a red blood cell. But the nucleus is huge. So um, identifying features of a lymphocyte are nice, big, chunky nucleus, very little cytoplasm, and sometimes you don't even see this much cytoplasm, very little cytoplasm, lots and lots of nucleus. Next type of agranulocyte is the monocyte. So if we look at the relative size of the monocyte in comparison to the erythrocyte or red blood cell, notice how much bigger it is. 
We just still don't have the granules in it like we saw for the lymphocyte. That's why it's an A granule site. But at the same time, it's much bigger than the lymphocyte was. The lymphocyte was um, just a little bit bigger than a red blood cell. For a monocyte, it is much bigger than a red blood cell. In fact, it looks like it can take three or four of these red blood cells and fit them right on the inside of it. When we look at the nucleus of the monocyte, it kind of has a U-shaped configuration to it. And I'm going to go ahead and try to draw around that U-shaped configuration. Kind of like a chunky U, or sometimes you'll see them drawn, or, or they'll be sh uh, shown in the cell as kind of, they'll look like a chunky C, which is a little bit different from an erythrocyte. An erythrocyte nucleus looks kind of like this where you don't really see that middle portion to it. Um, so for erythrocyte nucleus, you kind of have a bridge of, of like a extension that goes between one lobe and the second lobe, whereas with the monocyte, it's all connected together. So sometimes you'll see them look like giant C's, sometimes they'll look like giant U's. Going back to the eosinophil real quick, Notice that you have the nuclei that are in here, and it's just a little bridge, and you can't really see it in this picture that connects the two of them together. On to the neutrophil. Um, neutrophils have a trilobed nucleus. One, two, three lobes on that guy. One, two, three lobes, it's kind of folded backwards. Um, this is also a granulocyte, so eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils are all granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes are considered um, agranulocytes. They don't have those granules in there. Um, the most abundant of your white blood cells are going to be neutrophils. So if we were to look at this under a microscope slide, which we'll, we'll do next week, um, we won't do the whole lab, but we'll kind of look at some underneath the microscope slide. You're going to mostly see neutrophils. About 60% of your red blood cells are going to be neutrophils. So they're the most abundant of your blood cell type. If we were doing a blood count, or what's called a differential count, you would count the number of white blood cells um, out of 100. So you count 100 cells, and then you count the number of neutrophils you saw out of that 100, the number of eosinophils, monocytes, et cetera, out of that 100, and you would get a percentage. So that's what a differential count is. In your lab, we don't have it in our virtual lab, but in your lab it talks about performing a differential count. So when you, and also in your lab uh, homework, there's a differential count that it asks for. Um, essentially, all you're going to do is you will comb your slide, and you will look for, let's do neutrophils first. Every neutrophil that you see, you're going to count it. And you're going to count those neutrophils out of the 100 white blood cells that you find. So maybe out of those 100 white blood cells, you find 60 neutrophils. 60 out of 100 is 60% of those neutrophils. Um, and then you would look for eosinophils or monocytes or whatever to see if they were within their normal parameters. So that's what a differential count is. A red blood cell count is where you're counting um, red blood cells in the millions. Average ranges for red blood cell count for women is about 4.2 million, and then for men is about 5.2 million. The reason for those discrepancies is because on average, men have a larger body size than women do, so they're going to have a higher blood volume. And then if we look at this picture here, we notice that we have the trilobe nucleus of the neutrophil, or multilobe nucleus, or some another way that you can characterize that. And then we have the monocyte. So see again, you have that um, really globular shape of the monocyte. Um, this one doesn't actually look like a C or a U. It kind of looks like a B. Um, but you do still have that nice, chunky size of the monocyte itself, especially in relation to not only red blood cells, but also in relation to even other white blood cells. Your monocytes are going to be the biggest of your formed elements. And remember, when I say formed elements, I'm talking about um, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets are part of your formed elements of the whole blood. And then if we look at this, it's a little bit different microscope picture. Um, we still see all of our donut-shaped erythrocytes. And remember, what's the common name for an erythrocyte? 
RBC, red blood cell, um, thrombocytes are the scientific name for platelets, and you see those little platelets there. Um, we have a lymphocyte here. Now, this magnification is probably at 40 times magnification, whereas the other magnification was uh, for the previous slide that we looked at was probably closer to um, either oil immersion 100 times or um, 60 times, a little bit higher. So this magnification is probably at 10 times magnification, it's probably not even at 40, so it would be considered low power, so we're a little bit further away from it. But we do see that this lymphocyte, remember once again, very little cytoplasm that's there, and the relative size is not that much bigger than an erythrocyte or a red blood cell. And then we have our easily identifiable neutrophil, because it has that multi-lobe nucleus, um, one, two, three lobes in that nucleus. Down here, what would you guess that this guy is? It's another lymphocyte. Very good. And so just some more pictures, neutrophils, notice the multilobe nuclei in both of them. For the eosinophils, look at the bilobe nucleus we have here, a little bit of cytoplasmic bridge between the two, a little cytoplasmic bridge between the two. Take note of the granules. Now the coloration has changed a little bit simply because of the staining mechanism. So just as in AMP1, we don't want to really focus, if you will, on the color of them, although typically white blood cells are going to be stained a purplish sort of color and red blood cells will be kind of a pinkish kind of color to it. We don't want to really focus on that. We want to look for actual features inside the cell. So um, the features that we're looking at here are the shape of the nucleus and the relative size of the cell and also the presence or the lack thereof of granules. And all of these, including the neutrophil, multilobe nuclei, um, is considered, are considered um, granulocytes. And then once again, that lymphocyte, relative size, not that much bigger than a red blood cell, little bit of cytoplasm there. Mostly you have this um, nucleus that we find. Um, same thing here for both of these lymphocytes. Only thing that's changing is the staining technique that was used between um, the Leishman stain and this one down here. But notice nice, big, round nucleus. And we're a little bit closer up, so this is probably under 100 times magnification um, or yeah, probably about 100 times, 80 to 100 times magnification, um, whereas this slide was further away. So we're seeing more detail in this same lymphocyte as we look at it here. Monocyte, that funky U bubble-shaped nucleus, I'm going to draw it in there one more time. So we see this kind of funky-shaped nucleus in there, kind of like a kidney bean sort of deal, or the bubble character letter C. That was a very horrible outline. And then we have our neutrophils again, platelets, which are just fragments of erythrocytes or um, white red blood cells. We have our lymphocyte here, very little nuclei, nice, more spherical-shaped um, nuclei. Um, then we see for the monocyte, monocyte, look how big that cell is in comparison to everybody around it, in comparison to the neutrophils that we have, in comparison to the lymphocytes that we have. Um, we have this really giant cell, even to the red blood cells, it's like a Jupiter in comparison to all of the other red blood cells. But once again, it still has that characteristic sort of kidney bean nucleus that we would look for. And once again, more neutrophils, multilobe nucleus, eosinophils, phylum nucleus, lymphocyte, just a little bit of cytoplasm there. And so for these next slides, I'm going to kind of um, allow you to label these white blood cells. So let's go through them. I'm going to give you a second. Um, about two or three minutes to go through here and label all of these white blood cells. You can write them down on a piece of paper. You can just say them in your head. It doesn't matter. Um, but I want you to label those white blood cells, and then we'll go through the answers. All right. So for letter A here, multilobe nucleus, this is your neutrophil. You said neutrophil, that's excellent. Very good. Because in your lab practical, you're going to have some cells, and you have to tell me what they are. Next one here. Bilobe nucleus, the little bridge that kind of connects both of those lobes there, eosinophil. This one here, uh, kind of nondescript. Um, it's definitely got granules in it. Totally can see those. Kind of look like smushed grapes. 
going with basophil for this one. And then down here, well, we've definitely got our kidney bean-esque shaped nucleus, um, big giant Jupiter type cell that's dwarfing everybody else. So this one is a monocyte. And then over here, very little cytoplasm, nice, much more circular um, nuclei. This would be your lymphocyte. Very good. Now we're going to talk about blood typing. So we recognize that there are four different types of blood types. You have type A, type B, type AB, and type O. Um, type A blood types means that on the surface of the red blood cell, even though you can't see it on any of the pictures that we just looked at from the microscope in a blood smear microscope, you don't see that. You have to do a biochemical test for it, which we will be doing virtually in our assignments here. Um, but on the surface of this type A red blood cell, you have special antigens. And we call those A antigens. So you want to protect yourself from anything that does not have the same same cell surface receptors as your own. In this case, anything that doesn't have a type A antigen. So if you have type A blood, you want to protect yourself against somebody that might have a B antigen on the surface of their blood. So if you have a B antigen, they will have type B antibodies. So notice that, and remember this is all kind of cartoon drawn to show you, to illustrate this to you, but this actual a chemical interaction that takes place. But notice that the shape or the chemical configuration of this antibody is not going to be targeted towards the A antigen. It's going to be targeted towards the B antigen on there. So that if type B blood is given to a type A person, it's going to clump up, it's going to clot, and it can be fatal for that person, that patient. Because the patient's type B antibodies, it's anti-A, does not like A, will clot and agglutinate um, and cause hemolysis, the red blood cells to burst and to break, um, and, and cause this clotting to take place, and will clot with anything that's B. Conversely, if you have type B blood, you have A antigens. On the sur I'm sorry, if you have type B blood, you have B antigens on the surface of your red blood cell. The types of antibodies you're going to have, well, if you're type B, then you're anti-A. You don't like A. So your antibodies are going to see how they're kind of circular shape. They're going to be chemically configured to have a chemical reaction with A antigens if they're present. So a type A person could never give blood to a type B person. And conversely, vice versa, a type B person cannot give blood to a type A person. Now let's look at type AB blood. Type AB blood on the surface of the red blood cell are not only B antigens, but it also has A antigens that are present. So since you've got B antigens, A antigens, does it really make sense to have any antibodies? Absolutely not. So there aren't any antibodies that are on the surface of a person that has type AB blood. In fact, type AB blood patients are considered the universal recipient. That means that they can get blood from A, from B, from O. They can get blood from all the other blood type groups because they don't have any antigens that are going to cause agglutination or cause clotting to take place. If you have type O blood, that means your red blood cell is naked. There are no antigens on the surface of that red blood cell. So you don't have A antigens, you don't have B antigens. So as a result, you want to protect yourself from A antigens that might come in, as well as B antigens. So you notice that you'll have both types of antibodies anti-B as well as anti-A antigens on there. Type O blood type is considered the universal donor. There's an O in donor. There's an O in type O. So the universal donor are type O blood types. Now, they can give blood to anybody because they don't have any antigens on the surface of their red blood cell. So, of course, they can give it to AB because they can take everybody because they don't have any antibodies. They can also give it to O because these anti-A antibodies, they can't stick to the O because there is no antigen there. Type O blood type can also be given to people with type A for the exact same reason. Even though these antibodies are configured chemically to be against type B, well, there aren't any antigens on the surface of the blood, so it's not going to cause an interaction. So we can't give AB blood to B or A or O 
but AB blood can receive from everybody. So type AB blood can take O, can take B, can take A. Type O blood, although it is a universal donor, um, it can only have other type O blood. Now, we haven't looked at the RH factors yet. So the RH factor, which is named after the rhesus monkey which, in which they discovered that this factor existed, tells you whether you're positive or negative for a particular blood type. If you are positive for it, you would say, I have type A positive. That means that on the surface of your red blood cell, not only do you have these A antigens, but you also have another little antigen that's present. So if you're A positive, then you have this antigen that's present. If you're A negative, well, on the surface of your red blood cell, you just have these A antigens. You don't even have that RH antigen that's on there. If you're AB positive, not only do you have B antigens and A antigens, but you also have, and I'm just going to draw this on here for illustrative purposes, you also have this RH factor there. So that's what makes you A positive or AB positive. If you have this um, positive RH factor that is present, then you can receive negative blood as well as positive blood. Because if you get the negative blood, you don't really have any antibodies that are against it because there's nothing that's on there. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out how to erase this stroke somehow. Okay, so if we go back to this blood type for AB, and it's AB negative, which means it does not have that RH factor present on there, then it's just not there. It doesn't exist at all. If it's positive for it, then you have that special little factor. So if you have a positive blood type, then you can get, let's say you have type A positive blood, you can get um, O positive blood, and you're also going to be able to get O negative blood. It's not really going to affect you because O universal donor, so you can definitely get type O blood, and then because you are positive, you're able to get either the positive O type or the negative O type because you don't make any um, these antigens against it. Now, if you don't have that, blood, that, that RH factor, so let's say that you are type A, but you're negative, so we don't have that RH factor that's present, then the only type that you can get would be O negative, another negative that does not have that RH factor present. Because if you don't have the RH factor present, then you will have antibodies against it and it will cause a slight reaction. Maybe not as big as agglutination as we see down here if you have the opposing antibodies, um, but you will get a slight reaction. This comes into play um, particularly with hemolysis of the newborn, where if we have a mother who is um, negative blood type, but she's carrying a child that happens to have a positive blood type from the father, then they'll give her a Rogan shot because what her body will do is she'll start making antigens um, against her baby. Now, in the first pregnancy, it's usually not that big a deal because not enough antigens have built up because there is some mixing of the maternal and the fetal blood, but it's usually not as problematic as with subsequent pregnancies. So um, with subsequent pregnancies, she will have all of these antibodies built up, and it will start to attack her unborn child and cause um, hemolysis and hemolytic, newborn hemolytic anemia, which can be fatal and definitely causes a lot of problems and can cause um, preterm labor and preterm birth and that sort of thing. So if you are a negative blood type, your doctor is going to give you this Rogam shot for even from your first pregnancy on. You'll have the Rogam shot that you get. So remember, if you have negative blood type, <laughs> excuse me, you can only get another something negative. So for AB blood type, they are the universal recipient. If you're AB negative, then you can get the, uh, blood, another, like, you can get O blood, you can get B blood, you can get A blood on here, but you want to make sure that you're getting the negative blood type on there as well. Even though you're the universal recipient, you only want the negative side of it. If you are AB um, positive on there, on the other hand, you can get everything. So if you're AB positive, you can get um, A, O, B positive, a, negative, all of it. You can get all of it if you're AB positive, if you have that antigen um, uh, that, that's present. 
So um, this is kind of the same picture that we looked at before. It's just a little bit bigger. So the way that we do blood typing is that we're going to look for agglutination. So we take a patient's whole blood, and then we put it into a serum that has anti-A, or what we would consider A antibodies, and then we'll put in a serum that is anti-B, or a serum that has B antibodies, as well as what we call anti-B, or for the RH factor on there, that has these RH antibodies on there. So we take this patient's whole blood that we don't know what their blood type is, and we put it in each one of these wells. And we mix it up, and we look to see if there's clumping. If there's clumping, so we have A antibodies in this well, if a person has type A blood, well, type A blood is going to clump up with those A antibodies on there, and you get what we call agglutination. So where you see this clumping, that means that that blood type, type A in this particular example, is present. Now, notice in this well, we don't have any clumping. This looks like we threw the blood that's in there. And in this well, we see more clumping as well. And this is our RH factor, the anti-D, which you could just replace that with RH. So this person's blood type would be type A positive. Now, if we do another patient and we put um, the blood in this well here and we put the blood in this well here and in this well, notice we see clumping only in B and clumping only over here in the RH. This person would be B positive. Not really this is clumping. That's not so much. This looks like kind of little uh, fake blood that's in there. Um, if we see clumping in all three wells, that means that we have, um, there's clumping in A, so it's got an A antigen on that red blood cell, we know for sure. Um, there's clumping in B, well, by golly, there's got to be a B antigen on there. And then we also have clumping in the RH, so that means this patient would have type AB positive um, blood type. And if we look at the wells that no clumping, no clumping, no clumping, then we have type O blood type. And in this case, type O um, negative would be the, the blood type that we have here. So what we're going to do next is um, I'm going to show you an example of the assignment that you're going to do. So before we go on to hematocrit, I'm going to show you an example of the assignment that we are going to complete, the virtual assignment, and I'll give you the web address for that. And I hope this works nicely as I had planned. All right. So this website, um, I will link on to Blackboard um, in the announcement page, and also I'll put it in um, the assignments folder. Um, this virtual website is the first website that I want you to, to do. And this is going to give you an overview of that whole typing system. So what you'll do is you'll definitely read these introductory paragraphs. I'm not going to read all of this. You're more than welcome to print it out if you would like. Um, but you'll follow the directions as you read, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, you're going to follow these directions under procedure. So click the arrow to scroll through the poster and examine the blood types. So we have type A blood, um, and it shows you have these A antigens and these B antibodies. Then you have type B blood with B antigens and B antibodies and so forth. Then he says, click the View Immune Response button to learn how incompatible blood transfusion causes an immune response. Click the hand pointing right to advance through the steps. Click the hand pointing left to go back. Click the show blood type to return to the poster type. So we view immune response. Um, there is, you can read this, but I believe... When the blood is transfused from one person to another, when both people's blood will also is transfused read it to from you. one person to another, knowing both people's blood types is extremely important. Blood transfusions between people with incompatible blood type. All right, so there's that part. So it'll read all of that, or you can read it yourself. The next thing on step three, it says to choose a test tube of patient's blood to identify its blood type as A, B, AB, or O. So notice in this one, we're not actually working with the RH factor yet. We'll do that in our next um, virtual assignment. So what we'll do is that we'll take our first patient, 
and we will put its blood into the well, so it kind of automatically does it for yourself once you click on it. So then you would click the anti-serum for A and put it in a well, and click the anti-serum for B and put it in the well. And what you're looking for is clumping. So where I see clumping that's happening here, now I want to check my blood type. So if I have clumping in A and clumping in B, then I'm going to go ahead and check my blood type. So I will say that I'm going to give the label for this as type AB. And I want to check that. Congratulations. You have correctly determined the patient's blood type. And then we get some positive reinforcement that's there. So you're going to do that for all three of your patients. Now, things that you'll need to complete and turn in for next Thursday is that in the journal, you're going to have to answer these questions of, um, there's five questions, why it's important to know a person's blood type. After you answer those questions, and um, because it is, not that that's an appropriate response, but after you answer these questions, um, go on to the next one, and I hope it stays there. Um, I think you have to go through the whole process and, and save it. And then you can just print it out. So you can just print that out for your journal. You're not going to have to use the calculator for anything. It's just the default um, setting that's there. I do want you to complete this graph. So for your patient, if there was a reaction, you would say that there was clumping in the A serum and clumping. Yeah. Clumping, clump IMG, and then the blood type that we have from there, you'll have to tap over, is AB. And you'll do that for each patient. Um, and then after you've done that for each patient, you'll print that out. So the two things that I need from this particular laboratory, and this is all going to be listed for you um, on Blackboard, is I need the journal, the questions answered, as well as the um, uh, chart, the chart that's printed out for credit. The next assignment that you're going to do is another blood typing game, um, but this one is going to actually go into the, um, the portion uh, about uh, RH factors. And once again, this website will be available to you all on um, Blackboard. So the, this one's a little bit more involved, and it's going to um, insist that you um, you register for the site. So let's see, there's all that cool little stuff. And actually, I've already registered for it, but I want to go back and show you guys um, how you would need to register for it. Okay. Let me see here. I'm trying to find a way that I can go back and um, it will make me register for it. Because I've already registered my email. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to let me do it right now. So in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to move forward on this. So after you've registered, and registering really just ask for your email address and for you to develop a little password for it. Um, I just used a personal email address. It doesn't really matter. Um, the games that I really want you to play are the mission-based game. That's the one that you're going to turn in an assignment for. Um, for the quick game, they'll just give you random patients. You'll want to read this little blurb because it has information that could be useful. Select a patient here, and we're going to begin our blood typing. So we drag our syringe over through our patient and then drop excuse me, then drop it into the serum. So where it says A, there's eight, there are eight antibodies in there. Where it says B, there are B antibodies. And if you actually click on it, it will show you the RH antibody or it will show you that you have the B antibody and it will remind you of that glutination that could take place. And then we'll take our serum and put it also in our RH. So remember, where it clumps, that means it's positive for that blood type. So the blood type for this patient is, well, it clumped in B, so it's B, and it also clumped in RH, so it's RH positive. So it tells you, yes, you are bloody right. 
Now, um, before you can go on to the missions, you actually have to do the first type of game. Um, the first type of game that we have, this part won't come up for you yet, but because I've already run through it, um, that's why I have um, this came to me this time. But um, the first time that you go through it, you have to complete all the missions before you can launch the game. So this one was just a kind of a quick one um, to sort of get you started. So now that we know our patient has type B positive blood, then what kind of blood can they get? Well, they definitely can get more B positive blood, but that's not enough. She needs three more bags. Sometimes you'll have a patient that's going to require more than one bag of blood. So she's B positive. Um, she's positive for that factor. She doesn't have the antibody against it. Well, she can also get B negative. And who else is our universal donor? You have O. So we can use O positive and O negative. And notice your patient gets happy because she stayed alive. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the main menu here, and you can always go through these different tutorials if you don't remember um, about blood type and how we can figure that out. Um, back to the main menu again. It's a little bit different for me because I've gone through this already and I'm trying to show it to you in Blackboard Collaborate, but um, it'll be very simple once you go into it. All right, so start playing game. Um, car crash victim, we just had our car crash victim. All right, so let's try this because it's not doing what I want it to do. So I want to show you the missions here. All right, so we'll say play game. And then we have our mission-based game. So this is where it's going to ask for your email. So for me, I've already registered. If you've not registered, then create user. All right, and then I want to start playing. So there are, in total, six of these missions that you're going to have to complete. The first mission, struck by lightning, talks about how you have a patient that has severe burn wounds. So we select our patient, and first we need to type our patient's blood. And after we type our patient's blood, and we kind of just follow through the same way that we did before, moving our little serum, our um, syringe with our mouth, and we look for clumping. So what's this patient's blood type? Patient's blood type is A positive. So you click the X and you figured out that you're correct. And you completed that mission. So now that you've completed that mission, you can go on to the next mission. What you'll be responsible for turning in is that you'll need to tell me what the blood type is, so for this very first patient, all you need is to tell me what the patient's blood type was. You'll also have to tell me if the patient needed a blood transfusion, what types of blood did you give this patient? How many bags and what type of blood did you need to give this patient um, uh, for, for, to answer that question? All right, so now we're going to go back to, um, those are the two websites, and once again, I said I'll have those posted for you. Now, the next part of our discussion, the last part here, we're going to talk about just two out of the three major blood indices um, that we have for patients. Um, the blood indices are going to be hematocrit, hemoglobin, um, and looking at mean cell concentration and mean cell um, hemoglobin concentration. Now, when we measure hematocrit, it's really just a percentage of red blood cells that are in a sample. Um, for 
Normal hematocrits for newborns are up to 60%, so they're a little bit higher. They don't have as much plasma as we do. Because remember, in whole blood, you have the formed elements as well as the plasma, the watery, yellowish portion of it. Um, and for males and females, there's a slight difference between it. And remember, that simply relates to um, body size. It's just going to relate to the, the relative mass overall for males is much bigger than women. Now, when you're pregnant, it decreases your hematocrit, especially in your last trimester, because as a pregnant woman, you are going to have a much higher concentration of plasma that's uh, there. Now, for children, it kind of just varies with age, and once again, that just relates to relative body. <laughs> if your red blood cell and your hemoglobin are normal, then if we can, it's possible to estimate hematocrit as being about three times that of hemoglobin. So if a person has a hematocrit of 30, um, or 30 percent, the hemoglobin would be approximately 10. Now, how we would read hematocrit is that first you have to spin it out in the centrifuge machine. And what a centrifuge machine does is that it will actually um, separate the formed elements, which are the heavier ones, these red blood cells at the bottom, from the liquid or the lighter uh, plasma that's going to be at the top. Sorry about that. We had a little guest speaker happening there. So the heavier items, the red blood cells, after you centrifuge the machine that will spin the test tube around, pull up those heavier things to the bottom, and then you have some white blood cells, what we call the buffy coat in the middle, and the plasma is going to be at the top. So we want to tell what the relative percentage is of these red blood cells. Now, the way that we read it, after we spun out our hematocrit in our centrifuge, then you're going to be left with something that looks like this. So up here, this clear part, that's going to be your, um, that clear portion of it is your plasma. And then this dark red portion, that's going to actually be your um, red blood cells. And that's what we're going to be measuring. Now, the hematocrit um, scale goes from 0 to 100%. So what you would do is that, um, because you, it just depends on how much you took out of your sample on how high, you'd probably fill this two up to about three-fourths of the way high, um, that you're not going to always start over here on this side. You want to pull down your tube until the top of your line of plasma reaches the 100% line. So that could be here. It could be down here. But you want to, it's going to be different for every tube. And as part of your lab practical, you will have to measure dermatocrit. So make sure that you're pulling this tube down until it reaches that line that we have here, the meniscus of the plasma, is in alignment with the line of the 100. Now that we have this lined up, there's a little clay portion that's on the bottom. You want to have the clay portion line up with that bottom line, and then you want the zero to match up with the very bottom of where your packed red blood cells are. So now that we have this all lined up, zero, packed red blood cells start there, then we're going, and we have our top plasma line, it's at the 100. If it was up here, then we'd have to move this over slightly, but it's where it is, so it can stay there. So now we're going to read this, and this goes 10 and, and 10, um, Incre increments of 10, so we have about right here, that means that our hematocrit is at about 18. So if we were to look at this hematocrit, oops, I'm go that fast. if we were to look at this hematocrit tube here, notice it's a little bit clearer that you have um, the bottom lines up with the zero, that's perfect. Our 100 is lining up with the top of our plasma, and now here, we're looking at this, and it looks like this hematocrit is at about 15%. And the units of measurement for it would be its percentage of red blood cells, that's how we calculate or how we quantify hematocrit. We would say that it is at about a 15%. So because hematocrit is really just a percentage of red blood cells as compared to just the volume of it, um, anything that will increase or decrease your plasma levels are going to affect your hematocrit. So things like overhydration is going to decrease your hematocrit because you're going to have more fluid.
in your body more water. And as a result of having more of this water, then you're also going to have more um, uh, plasma, which is going to make your hematocrit numbers look lower. Um, a patient with severe burn losses, you've lost a lot of water um, because of damage to those capillaries, are going to mean that you're going to lose more water out of it. So as a result, a person that is a burn victim, hematocrit will be significantly increased. So remember, hematocrit is just a relative measurement of the percentage of red blood cells as compared to the total volume, including the plasma volume. So anything that affects that plasma volume is going to definitely affect your hematocrit. Um, hematocrit is done to assess the extent of significant blood loss. If you do a hematocrit, however, immediately after hemorrhaging, it's not really going to show you the extent of red blood cells that were lost at the time of the hemorrhage, because when the blood came out, it came out as whole blood, plasma and red blood cells included, so it's an equal proportion. However, within a couple of hours after the hemorrhaging, the blood volume is going to increase much faster. Um, then the red blood cells will be made because they can't be, red blood cells have to be made in your red bone marrow and it has to be made under the direction of erythropoietin, you're not going to make red blood cells as fast as you're going to replace that hematocrit. So at that point, it takes about 10 days to make red blood cells. At that point, you'll have a very low hematocrit because of this um, hemorrhaging. Um, it's important for nurses to remember that hematocrit volumes must always be interpreted in relation to a patient's hydration. Remember, with overhydration and underhydration, when that sample was taken, because black, packed blood, red blood cells um, given to correct anemia, the hematocrit should rise about 3% for each unit that's transferred on there. So you want to make sure that you know your patient's hydration, hydration levels um, um, to determine hematocrit. <laughs> So a patient responds to low hematocrit depends on whether blood loss is acute or chronic. If a person with normal blood cell volume loses blood, um, they can go into shock. However, a person that just normally has low hemoglobin, um, someone on renal dialysis can tolerate a lower hemoglobin, um, and uh, it's a little bit different. So hematocrit is just one of these blood indices. It doesn't tell you the entire story. So a little bit of a questioning here um, to make sure that you kind of understand hematocrit. Pregnant women normally have a drop in hematocrit in the last, last trimester of pregnancy. Is that true or false? It's absolutely true. And why is that drop? happening in the end of pregnancy because we have a higher volume of blood overall. So as a result of that higher volume of blood, we have a higher, um, um, the hematocrit is going to be lower um, because there's more plasma. There's more plasma in the blood. Expect the patient's hematocrit to drop immediately after a major hemorrhage. Is that correct? Absolutely not. It is not correct because immediately following a hemorrhage, you're going to have a loss of not only red blood cells, but also a loss of the plasma. So you, um, in the hours following, it gives you a better picture of hematocrit levels. So as I said before, hematocrit is just one of the tests that we use um, to, as one of what we call the, the blood cells or blood indices on here. Um, hematocrit, normally 37 to 54% is considered um, normal, normal. Anything lower than that is considered anemia. Um, other ones that we'll look at are hemoglobin concentration. Normal hemoglobin concentration is about 12 to 18 grams per deciliter. Anything lower than that, a patient will be considered anemic. And then red blood cells are anywhere between 4.2 to 6.3 million per microliter. And once again, that just relates to whether you're a child or you're an adult or how much you weigh, your body size, that sort of thing, if you're a man or a woman. The two that we're going to learn to calculate today are mean corpuscular volume or mean cell volume um, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration or mean cell hemoglobin concentration. Now, mean cell volume is just the average volume of a red blood cell. So that's just how much is inside of that red blood cell. That's the mean cell volume. And the way that we measure that, um, my lines did not go in the right place here, so let me try to fix that. Here we go. So the way that we measure that is that we take our hematocrit 
Um, for example, if the RM hematocrit is at 42, we multiply by the number 10. This number is going to always stay constant. And then we'll multiply it or divide it by the number of red blood cells in our patient. So when we do this, we have 42 times 10 divided by 4.2 million. We don't have to actually put the million in there, just divided by 4.2, and it's going to give you 100 um, of photoliters of it. And that's how we measure the um, mean cell volume or mean corpuscular volume. Now, for the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, also FYI, you will have to do these calculations for your lab exam. Um, for the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, that tells us the average content of hemoglobin, about how much hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is, is very important because it's what's responsible for actually carrying oxygen to all of your tissues. Excuse me. So hemoglobin is super, super, super important. Now, hemoglobin, you'd have to get that from some sort of measurement, so we can't calculate that right now. We have, don't have the tools for that. Um, but we have our hemoglobin, and our hemoglobin is going to be measured in grams per deciliter. So let's say we have 12.5 multiplied by 100, where I have the boxes around. That means that number is going to stay consistent. So this 10 is always 10 because it's part of um, – the formula, this 100 is always 100 because it's part of the formula. These formulas that I'm using are slightly different from what's in your textbook so I, or your lab book. So I want you to use these formulas for our lab practical. Um, and then we will divide it by 37. And that 37 is our hematocrit. You don't have to write the percentage there. Um, we just know it's in percent, and we'll just do it by the whole number, 37. So what we find is we have 12.5 times 100 divided by 37 gives us 33.78. So we're just going to round that up. 33.78 is close enough to 34. Then we have 34 grams per deciliter, which is our average content of hemoglobin. So remember from this slide that the normal MCV is 82 to 100. And then the normal MCHV is 27 to 34. So notice that for both of our numbers here for our patient, they're within the normal parameters. Um, if it's elevated, it's a little bit higher than that, then that means that cell is very big or macrocystic. Um, that could be just something that's average for that person, or this could be a cell that's on the verge of blowing up. It's getting ready to hemolyze. It's getting really blowing up like a balloon and it's going to explode. Um, if it's much lower than that, then it's abnormally small. So there could be some things happening um, as far as metabolically within the cell that are causing it to shrink or to shrivel up. It could be um, high salt intake, but if it's too, too small, that's also indications the cell may, may die. Um, the hyperchromatic and the hypochromatic refers to coloration. The more hemoglobin you have inside of the cell, the more darkly pigmented it's going to be. Um, so if you have lots of hemoglobin in there, very darkly pigmented cell, we have to wonder why that is taking place. And if it's very, very light, very faint, hypochromatic, we also want to know why we don't have nearly as much hemoglobin in there. For people that have a hypochromatic um, presence to their red blood cells as a result of reduced amounts of hemoglobin, um, they're usually hypoxic, which means that their blood oxygen levels are very low. And you can kind of, if it's really low, you can see it on the surface of their skin. They start to kind of turn very pale and uh, sort of a... Um, um, they have stenosis of the skin, a very bluish, kind of pale bluish color. So for your lab assignments that I will need for you to complete, um, they're going to be due next Thursday during lab, so you have an entire week to do this. I would spend this time today that I normally be in lab doing this. Um, make sure that you can identify each type of formed element in the blood. There's nothing you really need to turn in for that. That's more practice for yourself because you will see those on your, um, you'll see those on your, uh, lab practical. Um, also be able to type blood using the following website. Both of those websites we have there. To turn in, give me the printout of your charts and the answers to those journal questions for the first website we looked at. For the second website, 
complete all six missions there, um, list the blood types for each patient, and then list all the possible compatible blood transfusions if that process is applicable. For the very first mission, it didn't ask you to do any blood transfusions. But any of the items on the side where it was like the quick game or the memory game or whatever, those aren't due for credit, but you can play around with them. What I do want you to complete is the actual mission. So there are six missions total. Make sure you complete all of those missions. And then also answer these two questions. Calculate the mean cell volume and the mean cell hemoglobin concentration for both patient A and for patient B. Um, and those are the only assignments that you'll have to turn in to me next week, next Thursday. And then next Thursday in class, we will review a little bit of this. I'll give you guys the opportunity to do a spun hematocrit if you would like to. Um, um, get practice doing that and reading the actual hematocrit. There will be slides available if you want to also look at those slides. But we're going to start looking at the heart anatomy and um, the parts of the heart that you'll also be responsible for for your next lab practical. Once again, I apologize that I wasn't able to make it today. Um, we had a couple of things that were going on here at home, so I, I, I couldn't make it in, but I do want you all to still have this lab experience. You will only be responsible on your lab practical for the items that I have covered in this uh, collaborate session, um, which may or may not coincide exactly with what's in your lab book. So we talked about differential count. We talked about um, calculating mean cell volume, mean corpuscular, hemoglobin content. We talked about blood typing. So anything that was in this collaborate session is fair game for your lab practical. So slightly deviate from what's in your textbook. All right. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, do not hesitate to email me. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, we will have our first lecture. I will have that um, posted. It's going to be a little bit different than what, the way that we normally um, have our lectures because of um, the holiday and the snow. Uh, so I'm going to post a recording of the lecture um, for the blood. So I will post the recordings of those lectures. Um, they just won't, there won't be a, an opportunity for a live session of it until next week. Great. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you soon.